Hey guys, <clears throat> time to start chapter 13, Controlling Microbial Growth. Now this isn't about antibiotics. This is about controlling them on surfaces, surfaces of the skin, and surfaces of things. And we'll get into this. It's, it's fairly interesting and uh, it's got a lot of good information in this chapter. And at the very least, uh, I'm sure everyone's going to be happy that we finally left biochemistry and genetics behind and we're moving on and especially in something like this which is very clinically oriented this is real world kind of stuff that you guys need to know all right let's jump right on into it there's a lot of different products out there that can help us to control bacterial viral fungi microbial growth let's just put it that way now if we were to be able to make the perfect disinfectant or sanitizer sterilizer whatever we want it to be inexpensive want it to work very quickly want it not to go bad during storage and we would like for it to be totally harmless to people and animals and objects and all that needless to say there is no such animal uh, all of them have are compromised they you know inexpensive this one may be slower acting so that's that's what we're going to find in the real world what degree of control is needed well this is a scale going to the most resistant of the of the microbes the most resistant thing that we have to try to deal with is going to be those prions following that is the bacterial endospores those are hard to kill mycobacteria these are the guys from like tuberculosis uh, protozoan cyst they're very much like an endospore they're kind of enclosed in a very thick impermeable wall the active stage protozoa which are called trophozoites we'll see more about that later gram negative bacteria are can be a nightmare we just don't have as many things for these guys as we do for some of the others fungal infections that's a little bit harder for us to deal with because since they're eukaryotes like we are it's hard to find something that they have that we can target that you don't have for example the main one of the main things that we target in these guys is their cell wall we don't have cell walls but I can't target their ribosomes because their ribosomes are the same as ours and if I do that then I wind up hurting the patient anyway Following that, the non enveloped viruses, these are the guys, if you remember, they're just capsid and then the genetic material inside. Most gram positive bacteria, they're a little bit easier, although there are some that have resistance. And finally, our most susceptible is going to be the enveloped viruses. Remember, these guys are a capsid that is within a bubble of plasma membrane that it took from the host cell all right it's continuing on biosafety levels this is something you need to know one two three and four bsl1 this is basically these uh, bacteria are not known to cause diseases in healthy adults and they have a minimum risk to people or, or to the environment things like the non-pathogenic e coli we carry e coli in our colon and so it's very low risk bsl2 these guys are typically indigenous in other words these are things that are commonly found around us they're in this area and they we live with them these guys are associated with diseases and the diseases can vary in just how severe they are 
they are a moderate risk to people and to the environment. And an example of that would be Staph aureus. These are in in the micro lab when we're actually in there doing it. Those are the two that we deal with. Now VSL3, we're going up. <clears throat> this is something we don't normally deal with. These guys are indigenous or they can be exotic. In other words, these can be something that's not normally found in this area. And generally, it's maybe even from a different part of the world. Uh, think about Ebola that was brought over here from some of the folks coming back. Had to be very careful not to let it get established in our country. It would be a problem, even worse. Uh, these diseases are going to be serious and possibly fatal. And these guys have respiratory transmission, which is the easiest way to spread diseases, obviously, since we're all in kind of still in lockdown with uh, coronavirus. A good example of these guys was Mycobacterium tuberculosis TB. <clears throat> Finally, you got BSL4. I'm not sure how many of those. The CDC obviously has these guys, and I'm sure there are others. These guys, the microbes are extremely dangerous, they're exotic, high risk of aerosol, respiratory infections, and these guys are very much going to be lethal without treatment or vaccines, and some of them are going to be lethal because there are no, there is no treatment or vaccine, and obviously few labs. The Ebola virus and Marburg, which is a related virus, are in that category. So these, these are just the levels so that the different labs, and let me go on to the next slide. BSL-4, we talk about these exotic, very dangerous microbes. These guys have to do all the BSL-3 precautions, but these guys also have to change their clothing when they get into the lab. They have to take a shower on, when they leave and decontaminate everything when they're leaving. They are going to wear a full body suit with its own air supply, or they're going to keep all the specimens inside a special cabinet with a very high efficiency HEPA filter and doubly HEPA filtered exhaust. We're, what we're trying to do is keep people away from these pathogens even as they work with it. If they're wearing that suit, then that suit is going to have a higher air pressure than outside the outside air in the lab. That way, if they get a tear in the suit, then no air lab or lab air is going to get in. The air will leak outward and none will come in. That's called positive pressure. We'll talk more about that. We do that with our TB patients in the hospital. We keep their rooms in positive pressure. Uh, the lab's going to have to be isolated, either in part of a building or its own building. It's got to have its own air supply and exhaust system, as well as the decontamination. These guys are dangerous, and they can cause a lot of damage. Common protocols. We have... Well, let's first talk about this. These guys are what we use on living tissue people. These are what we use on fomites. Fomites are non-living surfaces. You've got disinfection, which really doesn't mean a whole lot. Reduces or destroys the amount of, of microbes uh, by using either heat or chemicals. Cleaning surfaces, bathrooms, chlorine bleach, the phenols uh, like Lysol, glutaraldehyde, these would be the kind of things. But there's no real standard as to what is considered to be disinfected. All you're doing is putting it on there. Whether you actually make a significant inroads into their numbers or not is still questionable. 
sanitation is also kind of a you know you can say something is sanitized because all you're doing is reducing the microbial load it's saying the safe public health standards mm, maybe they maybe they've changed that since the last time I did this but anyway again heat or chemicals commercial dishwashing uh, say those restaurants where they actually give you silverware cleaning public restrooms these guys are going to use detergents with phosphates uh, or the quaternary ammonium compounds and we'll talk about those uh, in just a little bit as well this is something that is totally easy to measure sterilization completely eliminates all the vegetative bacterial cells and all the endospores and all the viruses from a fomite or an inanimate surface this is how they prep the surgical equipment and needles used for giving injections these guys are put in an autoclave which is a cabinet which has steam that's under pressure think of a pressure cooker it's about basically what it is um, some chemicals radiation can be used for sterilization as well so all of this is for fomites you cannot sterilize living tissue that's not possible so we have only two things we can do I'll, I'm going to take these in reverse order degerming again all you're doing is reducing your microbial load uh, gentle scrubbing and mild chemicals this is hand washing guys whether you're using soap or the alcohol foam it's you're degerming you're, and a lot of this degerming is not about killing the bacteria it's about just removing them when we use soap and water to do that we're not killing the bacteria we're just getting them off our skin and letting them get rinsed down the drain that's all degerming antisepsis we're going to try to reduce as much as possible the amount of bacteria on the skin by using a chemical uh, cleaning broken skin after it's injured or especially cleaning skin before surgery most of the time they use betadine which is an iodine compound hydrogen peroxide boric acid isopropyl alcohol which is rubbing alcohol can also be used okay guys controlling the microbial curve so over here we've got some valuable information and we got something over here too so anything that we're going to use is going to kill we call it side or cidal so bacteria sides kill bacteria viricides you can't kill a virus but you can inactivate it and fungicides kill fungi that's and we're going to run across this same classification when we get to the antibiotics in chapter 14 <coughs> excuse me but that's these things are going to kill them other methods don't kill but what they do is they slow down their growth i don't think they actually stop it they just slow it down and then anything uh that does that works with this mechanism is called static bacteria static inhibit the growth fungi static inhibit the growth of fungi whether it's cidal or static depends on which kind of microbe you're talking about concentration how much of it are you using and the nature of the treatment how you're applying it the degree can be we evaluate this using a death curve to describe the process the progress and the effectiveness especially the effectiveness okay so let's go over here and look at the microbial death curve these guys are all about the d value and what does that mean the d value is the time it takes to kill 90 percent 
of the bacterial population. So if you look here, the beginning and here, started out with uh, 10 billion bacteria right there. The D time is the time it takes this disinfectant or whatever to bring it down to 1 million. In this case, that D time is 5 minutes. So in 5 minutes, I will kill 90% of the bacteria. In another 5 minutes, I will kill 90% of what's left, and then 90% of what's left until all the way down. And you can see here that they've got the little table showing you how long did it takes you before you get to theoretically get to nothing. At 45 minutes, you've only got like uh, 100 bacteria. So that's our arithmetic. This is logarithmic, but don't worry about it. Just remember the 90%. Uh, so you can compare these guys. So if I, if, I were, if I were thinking about using two different chemicals, I could look at this microbial death curve for both of them and find out which one is going to be the fastest, that's going to get rid of it the quickest. I mean, it's not the only factor to determine. we got to think about a lot of other things, but this is definitely something that we're going to give consideration to. Physical methods to control microbes. Heat. Heat is a good way. Heat denatures proteins. We talked about that in AMP when we were talking about our own proteins and the reason that high fevers can kill people. It also can actually make those lipids, I don't want to use the term melt, but uh, dissociate. It'll cause them to come apart and you lose the plasma membrane. It can also disrupt the structure and the functions of the nucleic acids, no RNA and maybe even damage the DNA. So high temperatures can have this effect on the microbes. Now here's two, separate these guys because they're, they're not the same thing. The thermal death point, this is a definition, definitions are frequently used in test bank questions, hint, hint. The lowest temperature that kills all the cells in 10 minutes, and of course this is in a test tube in broth. So the thermal death point would be the lowest temperature we could use that would kill all those bacteria or fungi or whatever in 10 minutes. Thermal death time is the time it takes to sterilize a certain volume of li liquid at a set temperature. So in this one, we're varying the temperature to see which is the lowest we can get. In the thermal death time, we want to know how long it takes for, say, 10 milliliters to be sterilized completely, have all their bacteria killed, and say I want to know how long it takes at 110 degrees C. Just pulling those numbers out of the hat, guys. Don't mean anything. So hopefully you guys can tell the difference. This is about temperature and this is about time. Okay, turns out that Using moist heat is much better than dry heat. It works a lot better. We use this for disinfecting, sanitizing. We also use it to sterilize. And they also use it to pasteurize. And you know pasteurization like in milk. Again, denatures proteins, destroys the plasma membrane. More effective than dry heat. You can use dry heat, and we'll talk about it on the next slide. How do we do this? Boiling. That's probably one of the oldest uh, ways of, of disinfecting or sterilizing is boiling. People have used it for a long, long time. Autoclaving, I told you, it's, it's an enclosed chamber that lets you have steam. And since it's pressurized, it actually, the steam is hotter than its normal 100 degrees C. We'll talk about that later, too. Pasteurization is the way that we treat milk and other things to get rid of the bacteria that are normally in there. 
And then we have something called ultra-high temperature sterilization, and we are going to talk about that in just a second. So there's a picture of an autoclave. We have these in a micro lab, and that's what we use to, on the things that we reuse, we send them through there. Uh, boiling kills vegetative cells and fungi and the trophozoites and will inactivate most, fat, most viruses. Uh, boiling time, how long that they are actually boiling, is kind of critical. And this is something that water boils at different temperatures, depending on how high up you are. If, if you're living in Florida or you're living in Colorado, there's a difference in the, in the, since there is less pressure here, then water will boil at a lower temperature. That's all we need to know about that, guys. I'm not teaching physics. You just need to know that. Um, endospores and those protozoan cysts and some viruses will go through boiling and it won't, won't bother them at all. Autoclaving. Before we put those in here, we actually increase the thing 15 PSI above atmospheric. So it's like, remember I told you, Florida, you're at sea level. And so water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. But in this, this tank, I take the normal atmospheric pressure, increase it another 15 PSI, and that actually raises the boiling point of water to 121 degrees C. I do this for 15 minutes, and it comes out sterilized. What they do, too, if you, we actually got some tape. And it looks like masking tape, just regular beige masking tape. But you put these on the thing, and want, and this is kind of like the proof that the sterilization occurred. If you do this correctly, then after the sterilization, you get these black horizontal lines that are on the tape. Um, the autoclave is used very commonly to do this, and because of that higher pressure, it also can have an effect on these guys. You can get rid of these guys. As a matter of fact, if you do this, and I don't know if it's this setting or not, but that's how you get rid of prions on uh, surgical instruments as well. Moist heat, pasteurization, milk, ice cream, yogurt, fruit juices, it's not sterilized. There are some microbes that can survive if they're heat tolerant. In the pasteurization, they use a batch method or a flash or an ultra high temperature, and we talked about that. Now, this one is high temperature, short time. You heat the milk up to 72 degrees C for 15 seconds, and then you, you put it in the bottle and you put it in the fridge. Ultra high temperature pasteurization, you heat the milk to 138 degrees C, which is way above boiling temperature, but you only do it for two seconds. And then you seal it in an airtight container, and you don't have to refrigerate it. You can put it on the shelf. It lasts up to like 90 days without any spoilage. Some of the organisms that we get rid of, Campylobacter digeni, this is the most common cause of um, gastroenteric upset, stomach flu. Coxiella burnetti, these are guys that hang around on animals. Listeria, the same thing everybody's getting from the back veggies. This is a pathogenic form of E. coli. <clears throat> this is one that kills people. Tuberculosis, a cousin called paratuberculosis, salmonella, and this Yersinia intercolitica. So all of these guys are killed by pasteurization, or else we would be taking a lot of risk anytime we use milk in anything. Ultra high temperature, 100. Well, we talked about that. They're they're saying 140. 
for one to three seconds and then you cool it very quickly and you treat it room temperature like what we talked about. <clears throat> this is the way that Louis Pasteur actually came to batch. 63 degrees C for 30 minutes. The flash we talked about ultra high temperature 135 for one second ultra high temperature sterilization that's what we're talking about here 140 degrees for one to three seconds and sterilization remember we kill everything even the heat resistant microbes are going to be gone okay let's go over here dry heat Guys, not everything can be get can be allowed to get wet. There are certain electronic devices we use, such as colonoscopes, that would not would not take kindly to moisture such as steam. So in these guys we have to use a dry heat. Well, there's our loops that we use in the lab, and there's one of those things that uh, incinerator but we use dry heat for what we for the things that we can't use moist heat it's going to do the same thing uh, basically now this is the kicker it's going to it's going to need a higher temperature and a longer time than moist heat instead of seconds it's going to be minutes I mean way more than this you can be like an hour at 350 or whatever 350C or F. Incineration, of course, is the ultimate of sterilization. You burn it to a crisp and you get rid of all the bad guys, which is what we do with medical waste. Refrigeration and freezing. When we put things in the refrigerator, such as our food, we decrease the the metabolism and the growth reproduction of our bacteria so at the lower temperatures these guys are going to be way slow um, liquid water is usually not going to be available it's going to slow I wouldn't use the word halt I'd say slow significantly the growth of most of the pathogens however there are such things as sacrophiles bacteria that are adopt, adapted to live at cooler temperatures and these are the guys that are going to cause your food to go bad in your refrigerator in around a week or so. Um, as far as freezing, freezing will actually stop. When you freeze something you stop these guys dead in their tracks. However, you don't kill them you just stop them they're in like a suspended animation so if you take it out and you don't use it soon then they'll be gone but we're talking about things that normally are, are cooked you're going to put them in the oven or in the frying pan or whatever and you're going to heat them up and you're going to kill the bacteria at that point slow freezing is more effective than quick freezing and Again, this is depending on which one you're talking about. That that is, of course, way different than our freezer at home. That goes to minus 70 degrees C. That is cold. That will give you frostbite with a very short touch. Liquid nitrogen is extremely cold. I don't even remember, guys. It is way. I don't. Might even be 200 something degrees minus 200 degrees C it is extremely cold you touch that even for a split second and you're going to have an instant frostbite but this is the way that they that they store these organisms long term is by putting them in the freezer especially if we had microbial species that we wanted to keep but we don't want them to actively grow we just put them in the freezer so refrigeration is good for slowing down most of the bad guys however there are some that can grow and do fine inside that as a matter of fact they they thrive there 
Uh, freezing is going to basically stop everybody. Desiccation and lyophilization. Desiccation is how we dry, we remove the water. The main way that this is done is with salt or with sugar. Uh, back before they had refrigerators in order to keep their food, especially things like hams or whatever, they would actually cure it with salt or with sugar. Well, how does that do that? Well, if you put salt or sugar in there and the bacteria get on there, this is going to be a high, hyper tonic environment. It's going to suck all the water out of the bacteria and kill them. That's why bacteria can't grow on the heavily salted or heavily sugared. It doesn't matter which one you use. I mean, it's going to be, it's, they're both going to suck the water out. There's some foods that dry, in, you know, like raisins or jerky, but the salt and the sugar are ways that people used to use, and some folks still do that. They, they use that to cure their own uh, meat. I guess folks that go, that go hunting. Okay, lyophilization. What a big long word. It's freeze drying. What, what you do is you do, you, you put it in, in, a, in a freezer for long term preservation, but you remove the water. And if you remove the water, that keeps ice crystals from forming. And if ice crystals don't form, it's not going to actually disrupt the bacterial cell membrane. And there's a lot of freeze drying done um, with foodstuffs as well. There's a lot of those that are done that way. Pressure. Exposure to extremely high pressure kills many microbes. Sure. Um, and like any living thing, they have a set of parameters that they can live within. And if they go beyond that, then yeah, they're, they're going to die. High pressure processing, pascalization, kills bacteria, yeast, molds, parasites, and viruses, and helps to extend the shelf life of the food. <clears throat> between, they use between 100 and 800 millipascals, or megapascals, sorry, uh, the pressure at sea level, normal atmospheric, is one-tenth of one megapascal. So that means that these guys do anywhere from a thousand to eight thousand times more pressure. So it's easy to see that this would kill in or deactivate the viruses. Uh, Kill vegetative cells, protein denaturization. Endospores possibly could survive these pressures. Again, remember, those guys are hard to kill. Okay, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You guys may have heard this. There's a chamber. A lot of hospitals have these. There's a chamber where you go in there, and it's like 100% oxygen. And it's also, the oxygen is at higher pressure, not high enough to hurt a, a human, but high enough to get that oxygen, um, to get it distributed more into the body. This is especially used with people who have anaerobic infections, such as gangrene. Uh, it increases oxygen saturation in the tissue, high pressure processing, don't usually use this for disinfecting or sterilization. And they've got a picture here. People used to do this as well. They would boil these and then they would can these guys under high pressure to preserve food. I remember a lot of, I mean, again, before refrigerators, you had to make do. You had to eat during the winter time too, right? Radiation. We talk about the non-ionizing radiation, the UV forming those thymine dimers. Um, Non-ionizing is going to have a wavelength greater than one nanometer. A nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. These are going to cause the electrons to take on more energy 
and to make them form new covalent bonds. And it can affect the 3D structure of things. And again, things have to be in the right shape. Just again, just like your car key, it's got a 3D shape. And if you change it, it won't work anymore. Uh, we talked about that. Now, the reason this guy, he does work, but the ultraviolet light doesn't have a lot of penetration value. Even a very thin film of oil on something like glass will be enough to block it. Oops, put my arrow there so you can see it bouncing off. It's okay for air, uh, some transparent fluids, and surfaces. Again, making sure those are clean so that they can actually penetrate. Ionizing radiation. The wavelengths are going to be one shorter than that. There's electron beams, the gamma rays, and x-ray. These guys are going to hit the atoms and actually cause the electrons to be ejected, to be shot off at an angle. These ion, and these are going to cause these, ion, these atoms to become positive ions. And then the ones that pick up the electrons are going to be in the negative ions. It's going to disrupt hydrogen bonding, going to oxidize those double covalent bonds, and even form some hydroxyl radicals. Remember, guys, these guys. And obviously, in doing that, they can actually denature and damage DNA. This is, you can see where the lethality is coming in. Uh, electron beams are really good, but they don't penetrate well. Gamma rays penetrate well, but they have to have hours to do to kill these guys. X-rays are going to require a long time to kill these guys, so they're not real practical for control. Now the gamma rays, if you notice, if you've ever seen stuff in the hospital that comes in these sterile packs, whatever instrument, plastic, or whatever, that's how these guys are sterilized. They put them in the pack and then they sterilize them after that by running gamma rays on them for the prescribed time. We can also do filtration, uh, physically separate the bacteria. What you need, in, and they're showing you here, is you need a filter that has holes that are smaller than the bacteria and then the bacteria can get through. You physically separate them. Uh, Probably the one that we're most familiar with is the HEPA filters. A lot of folks have those in their heating and air systems at home. Uh, these guys have got pore sizes of three tenths of a micron. That is, remember most most bacteria are one micron or so, small enough to get the bacterial cells, endospores, and even some viruses, and it almost sterilizes the air, but it definitely disinfects in a, in a big way. HEPA filters are used uh, in a lot of the clinical settings, cars, airplanes, and again, in the home. And in the membrane filtration is when we're trying to get the bacteria out of liquid, which we already saw. Okay, guys, I am not going to read this to you. This is for your uh, reference. I would look through this if I was you, but I just don't see any point because a lot of this is is repeating it. It's, it's good to have those tables. You have all the information in one convenient place. <clears throat> okay, we've talked about heat. We've talked about filtration. Let's talk about chemicals. Chemicals can affect their cell walls, their plasma membranes, their proteins, or even their DNA. And the, how effective they are depends on the environment they're used in. Uh, envelope viruses and the vegetative cells of bacteria, the fungi and the protozoans are extremely effective against. Let's talk about the phenols and the phenolics. These guys are going to damage the proteins and disrupt the plasma membrane. And these guys work in the presence of organic matter. That's kind of important because not all of them will. These guys remain active for a fairly long time. 
used in health cares, labs, and even in the homes. Uh, yes, they don't necessarily smell good, and there may be some side effects. And some of these guys are used in mouthwash, and especially in the hand soaps labeled antibacterial. So that's what phenol looks like. This is a phenolic, which is just a variation. The bisphenolics, and especially this one, this one I want you to know, triclosan, this is what is in your antibacterial hand soap. All that antibacterial stuff, a lot of it is going to be triclosan. It's a bisphenolic, a double phenolic, basically. Uh, heavy metals. No, I'm not talking about acid rock. I'm talking about actual metals. Silver, copper, mercury. Those things are kind of toxic to us, but they're also toxic to some of these microbes. Uh, silver nitrate, 1% was what they used to put in babies' eyes as soon as they were born to keep them from getting blindness from uh, gonorrhea. They used the marisol to preserve vaccines. That's the mercury that everybody in the anti-vax movement is really jumping up and down about. Copper controls algae. Zinc, mercury, nickel, all of these have antimicrobial properties. So the heavy metals are something, and we still use silver, silver sulfidane. The wound care nurses still use those on some of the, the nastier infections that we get in the hospital. Uh, that guy has got an excess of silver buildup in his system. It actually turns your skin blue. True. True story. Okay, in addition to the heavy metals, we've got the... Nasty gases, halogens, iodine, iodine, chlorine, bromine, and fluorine. Intermediate level, these guys are going to denature. Remember, chlorine and all these guys have got seven electrons in the outer shell. They're going to grab an electron from somebody. And in the process of grabbing it, they're going to damage that molecule which is fine, that's what we use them for. Uh, iodine tablets for, for water, I, iodophores, um, like betadine, which we use betadine almost exclusively. I mean, I've, of all the surgeries I've seen, you can see some betadine over there. Um, that's what they, what they, they uh, used on the patient for her for surgery. Chlorine bleach, that's what, that's what it is. Uh, chlorine is very, very good at getting these guys. Chloramines, which are compounds, and, and bromine. And, of course, we use fluoride in our water and in our toothpastes to get rid of the bacteria in our mouth to help us keep from having cavities. Okay. Alcohols, intermediate level, these guys are going to denature proteins and they're going to disrupt the plasma membrane. They have a very profound effect on lipids. They kind of dissolve them. More effective than soap for removing bacteria from the, from the hands. Swabbing skin with alcohol is how we get everybody ready. Everybody knows that who's had a in vaccination. Ethyl alcohol, that's the type of alcohol people drink. Isopropyl is the rubbing alcohol and it should not be drunk because it will cause problems. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. And generally in the hospital we use a, a foam, an alcohol foam to uh, clean our hands. The only, the only thing is that alcohol will have no effect on the endospores. So if we have someone that we suspect with an infection with endospore, we cannot use alcohol. We have to use soap and water. Well, you could use the alcohol to get rid of the vegetative cells, but you've still got to do soap and water. 
to actually de-germ, to physically remove those spores from your hand before you go to the next patient. Surfactants, uh, soap. <coughs> These guys have a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic end, so they grab onto oil with their hydrophobic end. The hydrophilic end is is facing toward the water molecules and these guys what the, the way it works is it loosens the oil and the gunk on our skin which the bacteria are in and makes it easier for us to rinse them off that's what soap does if you're not using the antimicrobial soap good de-germing agents but they don't kill bacteria okay now detergents um, and we're talking about the ones specifically for disinfection guy, not the kind of, to wash your clothing in. Quaternary ammonium compounds that are abbreviated as quats. These are low level, they disrupt the cell membrane, and this is primarily what the folks in the hospital and the housekeeping are going to use to clean the rooms. I mean, under normal circumstances, they, they can use other, other uh, disinfectants as well. Okay. Bisbiguanides, uh, catatonic, positively charged molecules. Uh, the, I guess the most important one is chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is... That was my go-to. It's called uh, Hibiclens is its, is its trade name. That was my go-to. Whenever I scrubbed up for surgery, I always used chlorhexidine. And it just worked really well. Active against yeast, gram-positive, and gram-negative, which is, I mean, you're going to put your hands in the sterile gloves anyway. So that's, that's pretty good sterilization. Okay, the aldehydes, these are alkylating agents. These guys are going to replace a hydrogen atom on a molecule with this alkyl group, which is going to be a carbon and two hydrogen, or actually, so if I have one carbon there, I'll have three. That's what the two N plus one. Don't, don't worry about that. You just need to know this. The alkyl group, and this is going to inactivate enzymes and nucleic acids. If you replace a hydrogen, if you change the molecule, you've changed its function. One of the most common is probably going to be formaldehyde. They use those in 37% solution called formalin. And they can also use it in a gas form. Uh, form oof, that stuff will burn your eyes. Uh, had a really rough time with that when I was doing my neuroscience class because the brains came in buckets of formal, formalin. Uh, but it's a very strong smell. Strong, broad spectrum disinfectant, biocide, kills stuff, kills bacteria, deactivates viruses, kills fungi, endospores, and you can sterilize at low temperatures with it. But it is nasty, and I think that's what they use for embalming fluid, too. I'm not sure, guys. They used to. I don't know if they still do or not. Okay, oxidizing agents, peroxides, ozone, parasitic acid, oxidizing the microbial enzymes. Remember, oxidation is these are electron acceptors. They're going to steal electrons from these guys. So peroxide, well, there's peroxide. Well, anyway, there's peroxide. So H2O2, we're going to wind up, we're going to wind up with an oxygen that's going to be kind of on its own, wanting two electrons. This is where where peroxide works. High level disinfectants and antiseptics. Peroxide is pretty good for surfaces, depending some some bacteria have a defense against it. Uh, not real good for, I know people put this on their, on their, on their wounds that they get, 
But the problem is that we have catalase. Catalase is going to take that and is going to break it down and turn it into oxygen and water, which is not going to do any good. Some bacteria are catalase positive, and they can do the same thing. Uh, use ozone to treat drinking water. Parasitic acid is a sporicide. They use that to sterilize equipment. Chemical food preservatives, all this stuff that we see in our food on labels, sorbic, benzoic acid, propionic, uh, potassium sorbate, sodium benzoate, calcium propionate, all of these guys are used to control like, mold growth in of acidic foods. These things are non-toxic and they break down easily by us and they don't affect the flavor. And they help to keep the food uh, viable for a longer period of time. Okay, we talked about our death curve, but we didn't talk about how they come up with it. This is one way of comparing these guys. Um, if I were if I were at a if I were trying to choose between two. Um, different disinfectants. I could use the phenol coefficient. They give, they arbitrarily say phenol equals one. And then this thing, maybe this is four. Maybe this is point one. And that kind of gives you, but this has been replaced. The use dilution test commonly used, they get metal cylinders, they dip them into bacterial cultures. And then they put these guys into, into like beakers that have the disinfectant. Now there's multiple beakers and of course there's multiple cylinders. And these beakers say this one might have one milliliter of, and this might have a tenth of a milliliter and the next one might have a hundredth of a milliliter. So what they're doing is they're, um, they're putting them in there. Then they take them out, they wash them, and then they place this tube in a growth medium, and they're looking to see which, what is the lowest amount, the highest dilution means, the lowest amount of the disinfectant that totally shuts down the bacteria that prevents any growth. This is the way they do it currently in our country. And apparently they're developing a new standard. And guys, I realize that there's an entire career field devoted to sterilization. We got school classes in it. But even if you're not going into that, you, anywhere in the hospital, you need to be aware of this. There's some nasty bugs in the hospital and you need to be constantly aware of them and don't take it home to your family. In use tests determine whether a used solution of disinfectant in a clinical setting is microbially contaminated you got to be kidding me. Nope, I'm not. They have found uh, bats of disinfectant in a hospital that had bacteria growing in them. Yes, how about that? And some of those are really nasty, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this is how they test these guys to see. So they take some of the disinfectant that they used. They swab. They take a little bit, put it in this broth. And then they, they take 10, two, 10 drops, put it on the two plates, incubate it. And if they get more than five colonies, then that's telling them that that disinfectant is, is contaminated. Which, I mean, it makes sense. You're, you're wanting to see that it, it doesn't do any good if you're disinfecting a surface. If it's contaminated with bacteria, you're just spreading more bacteria down there. Okay. This is, yeah, you can do this. We generally do this with antibiotics. This is the Kirby Bauer disc diffusion method. We're going to talk about this in the lab as well. We're going to apply different chemicals on a, on a little paper disc. Then we're going to, then we're going to, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take and we're going to, instead of doing that street plate method, we're just going to 
spread the bacteria all over that. We want a bacterial lawn. We're going to take this disc with these different antiseptic um, disinfectants. We're going to put them in here. And then we're going to see which one is most effective. How can you tell the one that prevents the bacterial growth the furthest? So you notice that this one is closer than this one. So this one is more effective than that. And you actually measure these with a ruler and do that. So that's Kirby Bauer. Again, we'll talk more about that when we get to it. Well, guys, that's the end of Chapter 13. I hope you have learned something. And I'll see you in Chapter 14.